Imagine looking up at the night sky, maybe you're out camping, far from city lights, and you see something, well, something truly out of place. <laughs> something that doesn't quite fit any known category, you know? Oh, yeah. A celestial enigma. What if our scientific labels, the very frameworks we rely on to understand the cosmos, what if they sometimes limit our grasp of what's truly out there? Maybe even push extraordinary possibilities to the side. Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're taking a plunge into a really fascinating and, yeah, I'd say provocative idea about some of these mysterious cosmic wanderers. We're drawing from a compelling article by Avi Loeb, a scientist who uh, consistently pushes the boundaries of conventional astronomical thinking. The article's titled, Dark Comets or Alien Tech. Now, for those of you who might be hearing his name for the first time, Avi Loeb is well, he's a heavyweight in the scientific community. He's not just a professor at Harvard University. He actually heads the Galileo Project. And he's the founding director of Harvard University's Black Hole Initiative. Plus, he's penned bestsellers that really challenge our view of the universe, like extraterrestrial and interstellar. He's definitely not afraid to ask the big, sometimes uncomfortable questions, the ones that make us rethink everything we thought we knew. So our mission today is to unpack his central argument. What if some objects astronomers currently label as, quote, dark comets? What if they're actually something far more extraordinary? What if they are, in fact, alien technology? We'll explore why this seemingly, maybe outlandish idea, is gaining traction in serious scientific circles and what evidence is prompting this dramatic shift in perspective. So prepare to have your assumptions about space and perhaps life beyond Earth gently but uh, firmly challenged. Okay, let's unpack this. We humans are natural categorizers, aren't we? It's just how our brains make sense of a really complex world. But what's the actual impact when that innate impulse in astronomy leads us to sort of force a square peg into a round hole, especially with something as anomalous as a dark comet? Yeah, it's a profound question because, I mean, categorization is essential for science, right? But it can also create these um, blind spots. What's fascinating here is how that plays out with these dark comets. Okay, so these are objects that exhibit what we call non-gravitational accelerations, meaning they're moving in a way that, well, it just cannot be explained by gravity alone. There is some kind of extra push or pull happening. But here's the crucial part. They lack that characteristic cometary tail. You know, the stream of gas and dust we'd expect from a regular comet as it heats up near the sun, the standard scientific response. Often it's to try and fit these new observations into existing frameworks, even if it requires uh, stretching those definitions quite a bit. It's a bit like saying, well, it must be a type of comet, maybe an unusual one, even if it doesn't quite look or act like one. And Loeb has a pretty sharp, almost uh, humorous counterpoint to that, doesn't he? He argues that this kind of labeling is like calling an elephant a stripeless zebra. It's an analogy that really highlights the absurdity, I think. He says, and I'm quoting here, technological probes have nothing in common with comets, and that an alien probe by the name of a dark comet would appear as intriguing. It's about recognizing when our labels might be actively obscuring maybe a much more profound truth. Precisely, yeah. And this raises a really important practical question. Why is it so incredibly difficult to definitively identify small, distant technological objects in the first place? I mean, even our most powerful telescopes have inherent limits. Think about this. A 10-meter spacecraft, okay, roughly the size of a school bus, at a distance comparable to the Earth-Sun separation that's about 93 million miles away, it would only occupy an angular size of about 10 micro arc seconds. 10 micro arc seconds. Wow, I'm trying to picture that. How tiny is that really? Can you give us a sense? It's almost impossibly small. To give you a visceral sense, imagine standing here on Earth mm. and trying to spot a single grain of sand, let's say a tenth of a millimeter across mm -hmm. on a distant beach. Mm -hmm. But uh, that beach is actually on the moon. Okay, yeah, impossible with the naked eye. Completely. And even our most cutting edge instruments, like the Event Horizon Telescope, which effectively uses an aperture the size of Earth, yeah. it would be utterly unable to resolve such a probe, even if it were actively emitting millimeter wavelength radiation. So the monumental challenge isn't just looking for a needle in a haystack. It's maybe looking for a needle that might be disguised as a piece of hay in a haystack that's also hurtling through space at incredible speeds. This makes distinguishing a natural rock from a piece of, say, advanced technology incredibly challenging just by looking from afar. So essentially we're talking about a kind of cosmic camouflage, whether it's intentional or not. Which brings us to what really drives this point home for me, and I think it will for you listening too, the concrete historical examples, the ones that make you realize just how often we might have been wrong in our initial classifications. Can you walk us through some of those uh, surprising misidentifications, those moments when science kind of had to backtrack? 
Absolutely. Yeah, there are a few compelling cases that really highlight how ingrained assumptions can sometimes obscure the truth. One of the most recent and vivid examples actually happened very recently, January 2nd, 2025. The Minor Planet Center, which is, you know, a trusted authority, initially reported a new near-Earth asteroid. Standard procedure, really. Right. I remember that briefly making headlines, but it didn't stay an asteroid for long, did it? Not at all, no. Mm. Within just a day, that claim was dramatically retracted. Astronomers quickly realized it wasn't a natural rock at all. It was yeah. the Tesla Roadster. Yeah, the one launched as a dummy payload by SpaceX way back in 2018. And Loeb's point here is absolutely crucial. Without the prior knowledge of that SpaceX launch, yeah. without someone knowing and reporting what that object actually was, the Tesla would still be meticulously cataloged as just another rocky asteroid in our databases today. It perfectly yeah. underscores how much our existing knowledge, or sometimes the lack of it, shapes our interpretations of what we observe out there. That's a fascinating comparison, especially thinking about deep space. It shows that even right here in our own cosmic backyard, we can be easily fooled. But just for a second, what made it look so convincingly like a natural object? Before they knew it was the Tesla, was it just its path, its orbit? Primarily, yes. Its orbital characteristics were consistent with what you'd expect from a small asteroid passing near Earth. It didn't have any obvious features from a distance that just screamed human-made, not initially. And when you encounter something that fits the parameters of an existing category, well, the default assumption is to place it there, especially when there's no immediate reason not to. This is precisely the kind of bias Loeb is highlighting that natural tendency to fit new data into old boxes. And it's not just a car, right? There's another one. September 17th, 2020, the PanStars telescope discovered another near-Earth object, COM20 SO. This one also showed non-gravitational acceleration, just like the dark comets we're talking about. And it was initially thought maybe solar radiation pressure was pushing it, like on a low-density object. Another classic case, it seemed. Indeed. It looked like it fit the pattern. But a few months later, further observations came in. NASA's infrared telescope facility identified something truly striking. Spectral features on 2020 SO. Features that were strikingly similar to, well, stainless steel. Stainless steel. Okay, not something you typically find in asteroids. Exactly. Not naturally occurring. This confirmed it wasn't a natural object at all. It's actually the Centaur upper stage from NASA's 1966 Surveyor 2 lunar mission. Just old space chunk. Yeah. These instances really demonstrate how easily human-made objects, even stuff we launched ourselves decades ago and maybe forgot about, how easily they can be mistaken for natural phenomena when their origins aren't immediately obvious. It's... Uh, it's a humbling lesson in scientific certainty, I think. Absolutely humbling. And these examples are so compelling because they're from within our own system. Things we created, yet we still struggled to identify them correctly at first. And then there's the big one, the one that really got Avi Loeb and many others thinking outside the established box, one Ayu Muama. Discovered October 19th, 2017, also by PanStars, the first interstellar object ever detected passing through our solar system. And guess what? It famously exhibited non-gravitational acceleration consistent with solar radiation pressure, just like those other examples we just discussed. Yes, Umuamua. And this is where Loeb's argument really gains traction, I feel. What's truly fascinating, and maybe a little frustrating for some, is that despite Umuamua's unique characteristics, you know, it's highly elongated, maybe cigar-like shape, it's unusual tumbling rotation, and crucially, that non-gravitational acceleration without a visible tail. Yeah. Despite all that, astronomers largely still continue to regard it as a dark interstellar comet. This classification persists primarily because its orbital parameters don't match any known space mission from Earth. So the assumption becomes, well, it must be natural, even if it defies typical cometary behavior. It feels like the path of least resistance for classification. And that's where the stripeless zebra analogy comes roaring back, isn't it? Because the crucial point Loeb highlights, the observation that really throws a wrench in the works, is that deep observations by the Spitzer Space Telescope detected no gas or dust around Wanaiumumua, none whatsoever. That's a gigantic red flag for something labeled a comet, right? I mean, if it's a comet, where's the cometary activity? <laughs> it is indeed a major discrepancy, a huge one. Comets, by definition, release gas and dust as they approach the sun. That's what forms those iconic tails. Umoma showed none of that, despite its acceleration. Loa famously described this situation as, quote, The emperor had no detectable clothes, yet comet experts argued decisively that the clothes exist but are invisible. It powerfully illustrates the profound resistance sometimes to recategorization, even when you have direct 
contradictory observational evidence staring you in the face. It can feel like the scientific equivalent of trying to force a narrative to fit, rather than letting the data perhaps lead to a new, maybe uncomfortable understanding. The Umamua case, yeah, remaining stubbornly labeled a dark comet despite all that conflicting evidence. It really illustrates this powerful resistance. It sets a profound precedent. But just for a moment, let's consider the prevailing conventional explanation. Why do many astronomers still lean towards the comet classification, even with this evidence? What's the argument for it just being a very, very unusual comet? Well, the primary conventional explanations often involve things like uh, outgassing from a highly volatile material we haven't seen before, maybe something trapped inside the comet, or perhaps activity happening just below the surface that doesn't produce a visible dust tail, but maybe releases gas we can't easily detect. Some theories even suggest hydrogen ice outgassing, which would be invisible to most telescopes. But, you know, these explanations often require very specific, almost tailor-made conditions, things that are yet to be directly observed or really proven for Oumuamua itself. It's often about trying to preserve the existing paradigm, the known physics, even if it means invoking some pretty exotic, unconfirmed mechanisms to explain away the anomalies. Fascinating. Trying to make it fit the box, even if the box needs serious stretching. So with these historical lessons, the real difficulty of identifying unknown objects and these lingering big questions from Umuma. Let's turn our attention to the new kid on the cosmic block, 3i ATLS. What makes this interstellar visitor discovered just in 2025 so intriguing right now? Well, 3i Atlas is presenting a remarkably similar enigma to Umamua. It's almost like deja vu. It too shows anomalous trajectory and brightness. It's behaving in ways that gravity alone just can't explain. And crucially, just like Umamoa, it also exhibits a pronounced absence of a cometary tail. No fuzz, no gas, no dust detected so far. So naturally, this immediately raises the exact same questions. Is this just another dark comet, another weird natural object? Or could we be looking at something truly different again? The pattern seems to be repeating, and it's really forcing a reevaluation of our default assumptions. And the timing of this deep dive couldn't be better, really. 3i Atlas is approaching perihelion, its closest point to the sun, on October 29th, 2025. That's coming up relatively soon, which means we might get significantly better, more detailed information about its true nature very, very soon. This isn't just some academic discussion. It's a live, unfolding scientific mystery playing out right now. What kind of data are scientists really hoping to gather during this close approach? Yeah, that perihelion passage is key. The increased solar radiation, the heat, could potentially trigger any hidden cometary activity if there is any. So astronomers will be meticulously searching across multiple wavelengths, visible, infrared, maybe radio for any signs of gas or dust, even very faint emissions. If it still shows no such activity, despite its non-gravitational acceleration getting stronger near the sun, well, I would further strengthen the case that it might not fit the standard cometary definition at all. Spectroscopic analysis during this time could also be crucial. It might reveal its composition, offering clues about whether it's made of natural rock and ice or something else. This really is a critical observational window for a 3 ILS. Okay, now connecting this to an even bigger picture, Avi Loeb also brings up the topic of unidentified anomalous phenomena, or UAPs, you know, the, the things found in Earth's atmosphere that intelligence agencies classify. He stresses that relating them to alien technology absolutely depends on getting better, more systematic documentation of their properties. He's basically saying we need more data, right? More clear, unbiased observations. Exactly. Yeah. That's the core issue with UAPs from a scientific standpoint. The current body of evidence is often anecdotal, or it's limited by the sensors used, maybe it lacks consistent data streams, all of which makes rigorous scientific analysis incredibly difficult, if not impossible sometimes. What Loeb is advocating for is a fundamental shift, moving away from opportunistic, often siloed observations, towards a systematic, scientific approach to gather comprehensive, high-quality data on these phenomena. He believes that without this rigorous approach, any discussion about their nature, whether they're terrestrial drones, natural phenomena, or something truly extraordinary like extraterrestrial probes, just remains speculative. It's about applying proper scientific methodology to a field that has, frankly, historically liked it. And that sounds exactly like the mission of his ambitious Galileo project, doesn't it? To provide precisely that systematic, data-driven approach. It is, absolutely. The Galileo project's goal is nothing short of revolutionary, really. It aims to systematically search for actual physical evidence of alien technology, both out there in interstellar space, like with the Momua and 3i Atlas, and right here in Earth's atmosphere with UAPs. Loeb calls it a quest for unbiased discovery. 
The whole idea is to overcome the limitations and, importantly, the biases that have historically plagued UAP research and even the identification of unusual interstellar objects. Unbiased discovery. That's a powerful phrase, especially in this context. How are they actually planning to achieve something so ambitious? What's their methodology? And what specific systemic biases is it really designed to overcome? Their methodology is pretty cutting edge, and yet it's designed specifically to counteract those biases we've been talking about. The project is currently constructing three observatories, one in Massachusetts, one in Pennsylvania, and one in Nevada, with plans for more around the world. And these aren't just typical telescopes looking at small patches of sky. They're designed to monitor the entire sky continuously across a really broad spectrum, infrared, visible light, radio waves, and even audio bands. But the real game changer, I think, is the sheer volume of data this will produce. They aim to detect literally millions of objects per year, measure the distances of any UAP candidates with high precision, and then analyze their properties using state-of-the-art artificial intelligence algorithms. This systematic, multi-sensor, AI-driven approach is designed to strip away human subjective interpretation and those preconceived notions we all have. The goal is to let the data speak for itself, objectively identifying anything that doesn't fit known natural or human-made categories without immediately defaulting to that must-be-natural label, which, as we've seen, has historically been a significant bias. That sounds like a truly comprehensive, data-first approach. It's not just looking for things. It's meticulously analyzing everything in a way that's never really been done before, specifically to avoid those cognitive traps. And you mentioned, as 3i Keyless gets closest to Earth, Lobes specifically tasked the Galileo project team to search for new UAP activity. So he's anticipating a possible connection, or at least using it as a period of heightened observation. He is, yeah. It's a strategic move. The thinking, I suppose, is that if 3i Keyless were indeed some kind of technological probe, mm -hmm. it might be actively monitoring our solar system, perhaps communicating or coordinating, and its closer approach could potentially coincide with increased activity or maybe wake-up periods for other related technologies, perhaps even UAPs if they're connected. Now, obviously, that's purely speculative at this stage, but it highlights the project's integrated approach. They're looking for interstellar visitors and correlating those observations with phenomena in our own skies. It's about casting a wide systematic net to identify any patterns or connections that might emerge from the noise. So what does this all mean for us? For you, listening, curious about the cosmos, it means we're potentially entering a new era of exploration, one driven by a concerted data-intensive effort to really challenge long-held assumptions. And maybe, just maybe, gather the concrete evidence needed to potentially answer one of humanity's biggest, most profound questions. Are we alone? Exactly. It's about moving beyond just speculation and anecdote, especially with UAPs. The Galileo Project, in Leib's broader perspective, is really pushing science as a whole to embrace the unknown with open eyes and, crucially, with robust instruments. Rather than always trying to fit every new, weird observation into a familiar, comfortable box, it's about intellectual humility combined with real scientific ambition. And that brings us towards the end of this deep dive. We've explored Avi Lowe's compelling and, yeah, maybe controversial argument that some celestial objects, specifically those currently labeled dark comets, might warrant a far more open-minded consideration as potential alien technology. And this isn't just, you know, pure theory. It's backed by those historical examples of misidentification we talked about, from a Tesla car mistaken for an asteroid to a NASA booster labeled a near-Earth object. And of course, the profoundly perplexing case of Oumuamua, which, despite all the contradictory evidence, stubbornly remains a dark comet in many scientific circles. And why is this relevant to you listening right now? Well, I think it highlights the dynamic, the ever-evolving nature of science itself. It's not static. New observations can, and arguably should, challenge our long-held assumptions. That's how progress happens. It reminds us that our understanding of the universe is constantly expanding. And sometimes, the most extraordinary explanations are the ones we initially overlook, often simply because they don't fit neatly into our established categories. It's really a call to maintain our curiosity and maybe some intellectual flexibility. So as we await more information on objects like 3i8 LAS, and as we watch the systematic work of the Galileo project hopefully unfold, it really makes you wonder, doesn't it? How much of what we think we know about the universe is truly objective knowledge, and how much is shaped, maybe subtly, by the labels we assign and the assumptions we carry with us? What profound discoveries might we be missing simply by not looking beyond those familiar, comfortable categories? It's definitely a thought worth holding on to as we continue to explore the vast, wondrous, and perhaps, just perhaps, very crowded unknown.